are we're going now. Nice. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I have been thinking about you, Andrew, because I think I owe you an apology. Because this is a great kickoff. <laughs> I thought you might like it. Nice. Because for the last few years, I've very much been on Team Justin with this whole Texas Heat thing. Uh huh. I'm converted. This is ridiculous. Yes. This is inhospitable to humans, yes. and I hate it. <laughs> thank, thank, Jen, Jen, can I can I hug you, but only briefly because I don't want your fucking body heat. <laughs> because I'm sweating all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah, summer know, started five uh, seconds yeah. ago. I know your pain. I know your pain. <laughs> it is late June. Yeah. This and is th- when it gets hot. No, and we have two well, more months no, of this? I th- can't. This is, let's clarify. There are four seasons in Texas. There's early summer, high summer, late summer, and deer season. And we are currently in early summer. We've not even got to high summer yet. Yeah. High summer's in about a month. So right now we're around like 90 to 97 degrees every day with 70 to 80% humidity in the morning. Uh, as we go uh, another month, the humidity will drop, but the heat will intense. Uh, so it'll be like 110 for a couple months, and it'll be low humidity during that time. Huh? It's not 110. It'll the be like 100 to 110. It'll be, it, 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 can, it can kiss. It'll, it'll kiss 100. Yeah. yeah. And, and Texas was a mistake for all mankind. <laughs> America should, oh, excuse me, the Texans should never have stolen it from Mexico. America should never have accepted it into the Union. The Mexicans should never have taken it from the Indians. And the Indians made a very bad idea. Very bad idea. Maybe you should rethink your decisions. Uh, it was, it's designed for lizards and buffalo, and, and that's it. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm struggling, man. Like, one of the things I love about being here is playing volleyball. Uh-huh. And every time I go out there, I'm like, I'm going to die. And I'm not really being facetious about this. Like, I'm worried about getting electrolytes and enough mm-hmm. water. And I will drink water all day and be outside for six, eight hours at a tournament and never have to pee, which I don't think is good. I'm just, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do this for the next three months. And summer uh, has been going I, on for five days. I have come up with multiple coping strategies. <laughs> Um, so you don't play sports. No, no, no. But I do, I do have to take Wallace on a daily walk and I actually will jog sometimes. Um, the, the best thing I've found so far is I I spent like $300 on a plunge pool, like a little barrel, a a barrel sized plastic thing (laughs) filled with water. I bought a separate freezing unit, a freezer, and I put in ice blocks in there. And I find that if I kind of like buttress hypothermia, so if I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the water down between like 55 degrees and 60 degrees, which is reasonably cool. Uh, so in, to put it in perspective, Barton Springs is 68 degrees. 55 to 60 is pretty cold. So yeah. I, will, I will do that to the point where um, if I'm in there 55, 60 degrees for half an hour, I will be shivering for 20 to 30 minutes when I leave. And I can, I can usually walk around outside for up to an hour without wanting to murder anybody. And I do that two, three times a day. Yeah, um, water is definitely the key. So I went and I played volleyball in the middle of the day on Sunday just to test to see if I could do it. And it wasn't like a competitive thing. So I was like, if I hate this, I can leave. And the way I ended up doing it is I wore a, sh- a sun shirt, you mm-hmm. know, with the SPF in it with the long sleeves. And I just kept hosing myself off like a dog, yeah. <laughs> which was fine. It did allow me to keep playing, but then I smelled like Texas swamp water. So there were also problems with my strategy, but that's what I'm... I don't see how, how I could ever play without being soaking wet. I'm, I'm looking impossible. at one of my friends told me there's a, a type of uh, rehabilitation technology that was developed by some collegiate athlete association where you put on like a hermetic glove that has a vacuum in it that lowers the temperature uh, so much that your hand operates as a radiator and it can lower your core temperature down. So oh, I need to, I need to look into how much this this costs, but that might be part of my part of my daily routine. I really am excited for the one glove heat and face. <laughs> yeah, it's very Michael Jackson. C- Cyborg Michael oh, Jackson. We can just put out new action figures where you have the the one glove. That's gonna be amazing. Can you also do an eye patch? Just throw up one glove and an eye patch. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then, yeah. The, the other bit is just I. Yeah, I think you have to get yourself to the mindset. You're, I know you're not a Star Trek fan, but like, imagine that there's this super cool planet where the people are awesome and the culture's great, but the planet literally kills humans. And yeah. you just you just have to it's remember that you're oh you're God. you're not designed to be there, and it, it will kill you. But you can go for like kind of brief periods of time out into the hostile These environment so before retreating your spaceship. Dramatic. I expected with him, but you, Jen, <laughs> Jesus, says the guy that sits in your. 
office all the time watching TV. Like, what sports are you out there playing? He does like, go walking. I actually saw you the other day. Uh, yeah, cr- you do the your street. Friday walks. I know that you do. Oh no, this was. Uh, yeah, I saw you Thursday, on a Sunday. Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Yeah, what yeah, I saw time? you on a Sunday. Uh, over by the strip club. Yep. Yeah, no, that'll be, I walk to the cigar place and I pick up cigars. That's that'll it, which my, is near the strip club. Which is right next to the strip club. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll do, it's usually about seven miles on Thursdays and Sundays and then 10 miles on Fridays. And it'll be anywhere between three o'clock in the Oof. afternoon. Uh, do you hate yourself? No, and I'm drinking and smoking <laughs> cigars, so I'm actively dehydrating myself is, is it, in the sun. Is it so possible? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like I'm all uh, genetic mayonnaise. I'm all Northern European aggressor. Ninety nine percent Northern European, one percent some other stuff. But ninety nine. Yeah. Is it possible that like there really is just something to like ethnicities being adapted? Because like I have several friends that live here in oh, town we're that are getting into some real interesting territory. I know, now. I know. <laughs> but, we're but, getting but, into but some this, real. To, to be clear, this but some people uh, seem fine. Fellow, we're like we're like we're like three Google searches away hold from on. calipers. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> fellow Britannic people, we made a very big mistake conquering the world. We shouldn't have done it. Not because it was a bad idea to organize other people's stuff. Good call. Because <laughs> it's too fucking hot. We should never have gone south of the English Channel. Like any conquer Greenland and shit, but anything below that, we should have just stayed away. Yeah, I'm just I'm not made for this. <sighs> I can I actually, walk I just think, fine. I actually think that this summer has been better. It has statistically, it's been it's drastically been, better. It's been which way is better than last year because last year. It was a really good May, and then as soon as May turned to June, it was just without stop, 95 to 100 for like three yeah. months straight. And yeah. no rain. At least this time, we've gotten at Alberto. least... All, all my, my only ask for this summer is just once every two and a half weeks, give me a rainstorm just to reset yeah. the like... Because it's taken like a week to climb back up to the mid nineties. Yeah. There was a rain. It got into the high, you know, eighties. And then like, it like slowly sort of climbs. But like last week we had amazing weather. It was actually comparatively yeah. better than New Jersey. I talked to my accountant and it was 97 over there. But I, I will say, I think you're a lot more immune to humidity than I am. So like, that's true. Weirdly. Yes. I, I actually kind of prefer it when it gets into the hundred degree territory here in Austin over this weird limerence phase we're in right now of just hell's soggy vestibule. Once we push through the, the moist period into the, the true heat period, the humidity drops enough that if you just sit in the shade, it's like, it's a hundred, but your, your evaporation actually works from your sweat. Like, whereas when it's 90% humidity, it your sweat doesn't work. You're just getting wet yeah. for the fun of it, for the 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 sheer unbridled joy of having a wet crotch as you walk around. But once you get into 100 degrees, it'll actually evaporate and you cool down a little I, bit. Yeah, no, yeah. I've the, been able to play in like Arizona where the heat's dry or Palm Springs, and I've been fine. But this is a whole different. It'll, it'll level get of hell. slightly better in terms. I mean, it, it is hell, but it's you're you're adjudicating which level of hell you're that's, going between. See, that's that's yeah. the thing is I really don't like the dry heat now. I will not bitch about it publicly because I think it's undignified. Mm. But I, in general, <laughs> would greatly prefer a humid climate to the the dry heat of uh, you know Vegas or Arizona or something like that. That I feel like my head is being microwaved and I'm slowly dying in that heat. Wow! Did you know that he was a lizard person? Yes, yes. I it's <laughs> You're I, one of them. I, I do, yeah. That that is something that I I am not going to presume anybody else has any agreement <laughs> on. Is that I, again? This I, is where I, the Star Trek thing helps. Yeah. He's he's from like a weird enemy planet where the apples explode and the the pears like are toxic and full of acid. But he grew up in that kind of environment. We can be friends with it. We just can't I, I, live I, on I his planet. I will say that yeah. like the first time that I flew back to South Florida after living in a climate that was not that, and the doors opened in Fort Lauderdale International Airport and I made my way out to where people were waiting and that wave of humidity hit me. I've never felt more alive. Oh my God. I felt, I felt like my body was like, you, sh- you should not be allowed to vote. You should <laughs> immediately, we should redact your voting. See, I, I'm, I'm literally, I, felt the exact... like I was being hugged by God. Oh my God. It's like, oh. it's like, uh, some horrible, big, some God. horrible fart God from the Greek pantheons trying to suffocate you by, by bear hugging you. See, I'm the exact opposite. I will leave Austin and go to just any state 
that never enjoyed having slaves. This is the dichotomy. Any state that <laughs> never enjoyed having slaves. If you go to like Ohio and you're like, you all had slaves? And they're like, a little bit. And you're like, how bad are your summers? And they're like, not bad. See, there's a correlation. I walk out the airport and I go, oh, oh, Christ, maybe I do want to live to 50. Every time, every time I walk out into any other airport, I say, oh, Christ, maybe I do want to live to 50. So you travel a lot. You'll have this wonderful experience where you'll, you will go to California or you'll go to Europe or something. And then you'll, you'll walk outside and it will be like uh, escaping Shawshank from a meteorological yeah. perspective. Yeah. And that was it was really eye opening when I went home to Hermosa Beach and I was out there. And like, first of all, there were volleyball nets as far as the eye could see at 730 at night, completely open free and I was just like my friends would love this because it was 65 degrees and cloudy and it used to be I would be pissed off when it's around Memorial Day and it's cloudy and cold at the beach I'm like what the fuck and now I go home and I'm like this is heaven (laughs) why would I ever leave this for Austin so and then I get back here and I was wearing my glasses and I walk out of the airport they They fogged up this yeah. has never happened to me before in my life. Mm-hmm. It's trying to blind me. I yeah. just, nope. I'm, I'm with Andrew now. Yeah. I can't. Good. Oh, good. Hey. <laughs> I, like, this, I don't know why. I'm this is the greatest day of my life. I don't know why life. you're coming to me like I'm the attorney general of heat. Because like, I was with you until now. <laughs> okay. I didn't ask for that. I didn't ask for this either. I don't know why I'm being grilled. Honestly, because you're stronger than us. I'm admitting no, no, no. weakness. <laughs> I, I can tell you, because I want... See, that's the problem with this country. I'm not revered as a man who can tolerate this. No. I'm mocked. I'm mocked. <laughs> yes. I No, the, the problem is what I want is I want to go into a bar here in Austin and be like, oh my God, it's hot, and have everybody go, oh, Jesus, is so terrible, but you know, the, the culture's worth it. But instead, what people go is, you know, I kind of like it. I like it, and at least I never have to wear a sweater. And I'm like, oh, God, how did all well, of these... maybe if you could start with an opening line that isn't so <laughs> frasiery and makes the entire bar roll their fucking eyes. <laughs> oh, dearest me, as he mops his brow. <laughs> Put chance an ice cube, barkeep. <laughs> From a swamp, ninety-six degree high, Austin, Texas. I'm but with Justin the heat Robert index, Young. which is a real thing, it's a hundred and eight. You real have thing. to fuck up the intro with this. I did. You, know this, this you had like, to fuck up the intro because you're being inaccurate with your ninety-seven. It doesn't. I was looking at my goddamn watch. Jen, this is like in Braveheart when when the old <laughs> leprous king turns to his son and says, now you're ready to rule. The, we are having this moment. You, I'm patching the torch on to Jen. <laughs> and somehow I'm more annoying to Justin I'm than you are. <laughs> well, no, I'm just annoying that we can't get through the fucking intro. I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm Andrew Heaton. I'm Jen Brady. <laughs> We're not fucking wrong. <laughs> This edition of the program, we're going to talk about Julian Assange, who is now free of his obligations to the United States. We're going to talk about the New York Times moving their popular podcast behind a paywall, as well as your emails. But first, we're not going to talk about the uh, debate that will happen on uh, Thursday when you are listening to this, if you were listening to it immediately on the show. We don't have a topic for it, but do you guys have any predictions or thoughts on the debate before it happens? I will just say, Justin, how greatly I am looking forward to watching the debate with you. Oh, yeah. I have had multiple friends reach out and discuss the debate as a... Where's I, my fucking invitation? I, I invited myself. I, I texted <laughs> just just so you know, I, I texted Justin and was like, can I come over for the debate? Oh, can no. I bring women? In fact, in fact, if, if I remember correctly, and I'll look it up if there's, if this is not correct directionally, Heaton invited himself to throw a party at my house. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, said I invited at least two people. at yours. <laughs> <laughs> Which you didn't invite me to either. <laughs> uh, I, I, I invited... And then I informed yeah. him that I'm working, mm-hmm. that I'm going to live stream the debate, uh, at which point he informed me, his girlfriend, another guest of the political orphanage that apparently lives in my neighborhood, <laughs> is also coming. I then tell Brian. Brian invites himself. Nice. So now we're having Great. a thing. We I, are did not, a I did not invite you... Because you legitimately hate this shit. I oh, did. yeah. You cried last time we did a live show. <laughs> uh, like, well, not for debate, but when we did the midterms, like, you were, like, you were noticeably, like, like, verklempt. Remember I don't this? remember that. When we, when we did the, the... I don't doubt it. The, 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 uh, the black, what do you call it? The, the midterms over yeah. at, at Brian's HQ uh, two years ago. Uh, and, like, uh, Justin and I were both drunk. 
Uh, and, and you were just very, and very also sad. It was just filled with hijinks. It was. <laughs> it was, had a smoke machine, strobe lights. Yeah. I was karate kicking different boards. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but that was also like three days after I decided to quit drinking, and I was all fucked there up. Was like, there was a on. lot. Yeah, there was a lot going, going, on. going on. Yeah, there hey, was listen, a lot going on. Totally come over. Would love to have you. Would love oh, to have Jesus. you at my party at Justin's <laughs> house. Um, but I, well, that's the problem. The problem isn't that there's a bunch of people coming over. The problem is we have too many attention whores coming over, and mm. we only have three mics. Mm. And so if you come over, this is now a whore. we're not wrong thing, and now Brian is going to be on the bench, and so he's going to be he's going to want a mic. We're going to have a lot of people that will want mics for for the debate, uh, which in general I like I like to be pretty dialed in on because there's a lot of like stuff that I like to point out for the audience of like, all right, well, this is what they want to do. This is the point that he's trying to make. They've been road testing stuff. Like we got the classic. Oh my God. Just the modern democratic establishment loves nothing fucking more than laying out campaign strategy by way of a list of experts. It's their favorite way to roll shit out. When the Hunter laptop happened, 59 intelligence officials have decided that this is a Russian disinformation. Today, 16 Nobel Prize winning economists all agree Joe Biden's economic plan is better than Donald Trump's economic plan. Oh, God. And the letter reads, it does not read academic. It does not say like, well, due to this, 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 we believe that there will be an increase or a decrease and blah, blah. There, there, there are 16 Nobel Prize literatures and or literature winners that have all looked at this. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just a campaign press release that they are putting out. So I like to point out like, okay, they're going to say at some point during this debate, Joe Biden will say 16 Nobel Prize winning economists all agree yeah. My economic plan is better than yours because they love that shit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so that's what I like, to, I like to point out. But since CNN is doing this, they're going to have two uh, commercial breaks, which we've never had during Ugh, a presidential uh, campaign, which, yes, gross. Also, great for us because it means that there's going to be a yeah, little break time. in the action where we can talk about what, things it, it, as opposed to just me just like stink eye in the screen saying like, Nice pivot. Here, here's why I'm excited. One, my like my political hot takes in terms of campaign and election is just re microwaved whatever Justin thinks most of the time. Uh, I like like I'm I'm much more like gosh would Keynes have said that I don't know I feel like I'm I'm in that fucking like masturbatory like egghead camp mm -hmm. uh, the Fraser bit but in terms of like smart play stupid play like uh, the strategy of it the strategizing of it. Justin's the best in the business, truly. And I, I enjoy getting that knowledge from you, which I then take onto other shows and packages my own, so it really <laughs> helps me. But the, the main thing, though, is I'm not excited about this election. I'm not excited about the prospects. I'm not excited about the candidates. But I take solace knowing that I will have fun watching the debate with you. It will be a fun experience. We will have fun watching this. Yes. It's going to be uh, – it'll be friends having fun. Uh, and so, like, I've already talked to other friends. The reason that I invited Anna was I think uh, I, I want to say my the, your neighbor um, was like, like, oh, it's going to be so depressing. Like, are you going to be around? And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to be depressed at all. I'm going to be cracking jokes with with yeah. Justin watching this like and we'll have like Jim Cramer prop work <laughs> that we can play with <laughs> like a red button. We hit you. I saw some of your awesome uh, game. Oh, yeah, we have uh, we have our bingo card that is being uh, being built right now. But, uh, yeah, there we go. We have n things that will be said January 6th, Hunter, Operation Warp Speed, a reminder of the rules, felon, Ashley Biden's diary. That one I think I might take off because that's, that's not likely. Ashley Trump Biden's, what is might Ashley bring that Biden's up. diary? Trump uh, is a fucking mean dude. He might bring it up. He might, yeah. Uh, uh, but, yeah, bloodbath. That's like uh, a finish your beer, though. Like that's a big one. If, yeah, in, in a drinking game for sure, because that's not likely. And then I added sixteen Nobel Prize winning economists because I feel like that is that is now definitely going to be uh, going to be there. Well, I do think that's kind of that a, that... A, a weird misstep for the Democrats in that they they are re like since twenty sixteen they've really really leaned hard into the experts decided this thing. There you go. There they you go. Love experts. They, oh yeah. my god, did they love experts? There, there used to be like um, uh, longtime listeners will note if you go back through our logs here, you will not find Heaton saying 
uh, right wing, left wing, center left. I, I've tried to banish that terminology from my, my lexicon because I think that it's a, a harmful and useless paradigm. Uh, but there used to be, for people that believe that there's something essential to the left or to the right, uh, an idea that the conservatives were hierarchical thinkers, whereas the, the progressives are egalitarian thinkers. And there might be something to that in terms of like deference to elders, but there's definitely this like expert, non-expert dichotomy that exists within uh, the progressive I, I, ranks I, right Yeah, now. I will say that is not from the progressive wing of that democratic coalition. Mm. That is that is very much from the, the leftist uh, side of it from, from the, the, uh, we, we, the Camelot Kennedy, uh, uh, wing of like, yes, finally, we are putting together the, the great, okay, it's from the establishment. Oh, like, yeah. like oh, yeah. your betters have decided everybody eat your vegetables wing. And I think what's, what's gotten gross about it, in my opinion, is that we're beyond the point of behind closed doors where I assume the Biden campaign is circulating this letter that they want to get a bunch of very, you know, uh, people with Nobel prizes to sign it. I don't think that there's a lot of crosstalk of, Hey, should I sign this? It's more Trump cannot be president. And so I must sign this because this is a political it's, it's important politically. And if the campaign's telling you that you have no reason not to believe it. Uh, and if you can help, then that's what you want to do. And and that kind of essentialism, I think, actively erodes what they want out of this, which is that experts matter. It is an active erosion of faith in institutions if you just throw this stuff out where it's clearly a rollout of a talking point. That Biden is going to go into this debate and he needs to say, the economy is great and Donald Trump will ruin my great economy. Those are two things that he has to establish for independent voters. Uphill battle, by the way, because I'm this is like, hey, we're doing pretty well right now is like a heat and talking point for the last like 10 years. We're like, no, look, historically, we're doing way better than the 50s. And like, my God, the 1800s. No one likes that conversation. Everybody hates that conversation. <laughs> Everybody's like, maybe for you, fuckwad. Like, that's it. It's it's not a good place to be. It's it's you're at the bottom Did you of get a hill. That feedback with the 50s episode. Uh, pe- people liked the '50s episode. They they enjoyed. I finally that. got to the end of it. Thank you. All seven hours. All seven that hours. Was as long as that OJ <laughs> you know what? documentary. There was a lot of comedy in it too, right? It was, it was a good episode. No, no, no. I, I enjoyed every second of it. Uh, the the '50s episode. Um, that that one got positive feedback. It's more of like just when I'm talking to people conversationally. There there is a presumption. There there is a very very intense presumption that life is really bad right now compared to all prior periods, and and that's just kind of built in. Like when I, particularly when I talk to anybody younger. Yeah, um, like anybody that's right out of college, and uh, there are bad things. I'm not saying the world is perfect. I'm not saying anything like that. Uh, but but when I start going, well, no, like actually, when you look at the job market for people your age compared to like 2008 or 2000, like whatever the thing is, that like um, goes over like a lead balloon. Yes, it it does not go well. And I am not running for president. I might run for vice president on the Whig party, <laughs> but I'm not running for president. Uh, Jen, do you have any expectations from this debate? Are you even going to watch it? Are you going to come to my house? Well, apparently I'm watching it at home by myself because I'm not <laughs> wanted oh, here. You so are, you are, you are, you are always, you are always invited no matter what. But also. Just because you fucking got caught on air. <laughs> not caught on air. We brought it up. <laughs> um, I self-reported. <laughs> no, I was, I was planning on watching it and taking notes because I figured we'd be talking about it next week after it happens. So I was just going to, you know watch it but be, be, i don't have any expectations it's it's two guys it's gonna be choreographed it's gonna be cnn moderating i just i don't know i'm not i'm not expecting to learn much but i the debates are the one part of the whole campaign thing that i think are the most important i think they're really important to watch these guys go head to head so yeah of course i'm gonna watch it but mm-hmm. um i don't have any but do you think it's gonna be too uh too choreographed oh yeah I don't think there's going to be very hard questions. Um, yeah, I just I have very very low expectations of a CNN hosted debate. Basically, who's hosting I think this it's one? It's going to be a Jake lot of soft balls. Yeah, and Jake Donna Bash. Yeah. Like, ugh. Wasn't Donna Bash the one that worked for George W. Bush? No, that's Dana Perino. Uh, She's on Fox. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a lot of expectations. I miss the the League of Women Voters, but I'll watch it because it's all we got. 
before we What's lose- your favorite League of Women Voters organized debate? I just think that they were more fair. Which one, though? Which which was the most fair? Carter Reagan? Child. Carter Reagan? Yeah. There you go again. With what? That's With what, wanting that's the what Reagan said. Wanting the that's corporate press to not during the Carter by the way, I, I watched that debate. There's so much pathos in it. Like, and I like Jimmy Carter, by the way, unabashedly. I actually think he was a pretty good president. Um, but you you can just the whole time you can see him giving side eye at Reagan where he's like, fuck, this guy's gonna win. You can see it in his eyes that he's like, God damn it, they're gonna vote for this guy. Like it's fun to watch because you can see yeah. the kabuki. Or not not, not the yeah. kabuki, the, the reality. The reality, yeah. Uh, okay, before I forget, yes. this episode will be dropping presumably Thursday morning. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the debate is Thursday night. For listeners that are listening right now that would like to watch the live stream, where can they find it? You can find it on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Justin R. Young. You can find it at YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash at politics, 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 or on X or Twitter. It'll be live streaming there as well, at Justin R. Young. The uh, big question is, we're going to have the debate in a little corner in, in this little uh, uh, bug for people who are watching right now. Like the, the old school sign language type thing? Exactly. So okay. it'll, be, it'll be in that box. Will the audio work? The audio will work as much as we want it to work. The okay. question then becomes whether or not we're going to get pulled. Yeah. Because that's a thing that's up in the air on CNN is allowing it to be streamed or sorry, it is allowing it to be simulcast to other television stations. So like Fox News is going to air it, MSNBC is going to air it, uh, uh, everybody is allowed to air it as long as you air the commercial breaks unbroken and you don't put any graphic over top of the CNN graphic. Those were the rules that CNN established. But what we don't know, even though it will be on CNN's YouTube channel, we do not know what their restreaming rules are and essentially... That is whether or not they're going to send out their kill squad to file DMCA notices against other people who are infringing on the ability for them to get the numbers that they would get on their YouTube. We don't know what that is. It's a very poorly explained part of our modern media landscape. Breaking points got into a thing yesterday, but they got an email from CNN saying that they were not allowed to simulcast and it will be on the YouTube. What I don't, Imagine that breaking points would have to use the simulcast in the way that Fox News does, that breaking points being an internet friendly and focused uh, production staff would probably just be taking it off the YouTube anyway. So I don't know whether or not that was them saying we are going to kill every competitive stream or if no, you're not a television station, we're not offering you the simulcast in the way that we would offer Fox News the simulcast, for example. It's just that became well, a thing the, yesterday. At the I, very I, least, you could yeah. just Mystery Science Theater three thousand this, where or what are they? Uh, I can't. Whatever the successor state was, where you and I are live streaming it, and you watch it at home on your own or something. So right? what I've done in the past is at my most riff tracks. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, at my most careful, I'll just play it loud off another thing, and so you'll be able to hear it and sync it up with what you are watching over the, the the sound that will come over our mics. Or I will actually have it coming through the board, but I'll just have it very low and I won't put the pictures. Usually it's the pictures that get you in trouble. It, it, it's the video that, that gets you. That being said, I've never been pulled off except for once. Uh, I got DMCA'd on Twitch for watching a debate, but it was a fake DMCA notice because that's a very terrible system. I, I finally got... Out, Pulled on YouTube last week, first time ever. Uh, the RFK episode I did was flagged as misinformation because I did my best to just explain this is what he is saying about vaccines. And then, like, go out of my way to explain I am not a doctor. You got... I am not assessing the veracity of these statements. I myself got jabbed three times, like, etc. But, but this... I was trying to give as best I could a synopsis of a presidential... press. got flagged as misinformation? Yeah. Because I, like... I, I like this is my interpretation of RFK Jr.'s positions, and and like like this is what an adjuvant is according to him, and and but yeah, I mean I think it was overactive bots. I don't think any I don't think a censor was sitting there going. Have you uh, have you uh, appealed it? No, I I mean I might like you should yeah you should. because those things add up. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, then maybe I will then. Yeah. But can we just big picture for just one second? Sure. Look at the fact that we have a presidential debate that's being controlled by the corporate media. 
that is really only giving the green light to other corporate media to air this shit. Like, I just feel like in a country like ours, it should be on C-SPAN. It should be it free C-SPAN. for everyone to use. But, like, just the fact that they're pulling copyright or that we have to question that is a fucked up thing that's happening. I, I, and as these corporate stations are having more and more control over our process, this is why I have concerns about everything that I'm seeing right now. Like, I don't like that CNN is calling the shots. I, I will say we don't know what the actual situation, the, the, the breaking point situation is weird because yeah. we, do, we don't know what the email that breaking point sent was. Breaking points put up the email that CNN sent back, which was very, it was like one line. Uh, I don't know whether or not CNN is talking about their simulcast, which is a technical thing that they would be working with, giving like a satellite feed to another network that has the capability to pull that down and has to process things in a different way. Not like us, where we're literally just screen grabbing a browser that is already playing and then running it. And I would assume that that's probably what breaking points would be looking to do because they're in the same kind of boat that we are, but I don't know. And that's the thing. It's like the question mark itself is a problem. It's very annoying that, especially for stuff like this, there's not a very clear uh, ruling on you are just allowed to co-stream this yeah. and any DMC. Cause really the, the problem we're going to get technical here. The problem isn't that, CNN would either pull people, uh, uh, take down streams because of DMCA's. The problem is, is that they're not giving the clear uh, signal to YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, that any DMCA's that do come in are fraudulent. Because if they say everyone's allowed to co-stream this, then that means if a DMCA comes in and now a human has to do a thing to look at the stream and then pull it down, then they will say, no, CNN has said co-streaming is fine on this. Cause that's the only time that my stream got taken down was somebody who was just being an asshole and wanted to take down a bunch of political streams in the middle of a democratic debate. And so I got suspended for two days and blah, blah, blah. But the DMCA claim wasn't real. And by the time that that happened, I got all my account back. But if CNN says, everything's cool, then that means that any DMCA claim that comes in will be ignored. And that's, I think, the frustration that I have with them being opaque about it. But also, I just don't know if anybody in that organization is even thinking about this shit. I just don't like them having this power. Well, they are putting it together. They are producing the event. And they're lucky to have the privilege to get to do this because this is such an important moment for our country. And I think that they are in a privileged position and the fact that we are even giving them that power, I think, is a it's a mistake. I think we should be having an impartial um, organization running all of these debates that have the national interest like a and not their on presidential. Debates. Well, not one that was created by the Democrats and Republicans in order to exclude all of the other parties. So it depends on what the commission is. But I think having corporate interests that are now inserting commercials into the debate, um, their interests are not the national interests. The interests are their shareholder interests, and I think that that is an important distinction. I just don't like the way these debates are being shifted into the corporate media landscape. I don't think it's good for us. I care about the format of the debate. I don't really care who the, the agent is that's carrying it. So like, like the commercial breaks doesn't bother me. I don't think that that like sullies the process. What sullies the process is excluding. I hope it's something really, really embarrassing. Like, yeah, like CNN, CNN runs ads for like a kitty litter that shows whether or not your cat's peeing blood. Like, yeah. I really yeah, yeah. want that to be in, but, uh, but that, in, in the that, next. That doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm much more worried about but excluding candidates. what if it's candidates. sponsored by Boeing? What if it's sponsored by Raytheon? And like, we don't get questions about these things because our debates are now sponsored by both Boeing and Raytheon, who make direct profits off of wars. And so if so they the, are incentivized the, to not really push these candidates on questions related to the things that would upset their sponsors. Like that is where the corruption comes in. And that's why I have a concern about it because they are financially incentivized to steer clear of certain topics if they are being paid by these Okay, I mean, like, again, like I'm not, I'm not nearly as worried about the, the financial mechanics of this. I'm much more worried about the, the format, the, the people that are being excluded, that kind of thing. What would be the alternative that you would want? Like spell that out for me. What does an ideal system look like? 
I'd like to have it be government controlled in some way, like if whether it's a commission or if there's some kind of board or something like that. But I think it should be an official part of our election process as opposed to private interests that are getting control over something that is a national. So that means that candidates would be compelled to debate. What do you mean by compelled to debate? They'd be like, forced to. So would, would, would this just mean sure. that the, the in- they seem to want to. Who who runs it? Does the incumbent like a, have a, somebody in charge of it that sets the rules? Does the does Congress do it? Like who? Because it's going to be weaponized regardless. I would, I would love if the incumbent got to pick, like everything. So you had to like come into the incumbent's lair. Yeah. Like they're like Joe's going to do it on the set of Morning Joe, and like he got to set the time. Like, I feel like, like I, you could have a commission that has, let's, and I'm pulling numbers out of my ass. I've had 20 seconds to think about this, but let's say you had nine people and it's based on ballot access. And so the, the parties based on how many ballots there are, get a certain number of people on the commission and that's how they determine the rules or the location or whatever like that. But I think in a situation like that, you'd be more likely to have a seat that is controlled by, in, in this case, um, the libertarians have the second to no, the third to most ballot access, then it's the Greens, then it's RFK Jr. Like, I do think that there is a way to have representation based on actual voting as opposed to CNN thinks these are the top two, so these are the two that we're going to Yeah, we're, we're, like, we're, we're in complete agreement that these should be more open and that, that more people should be involved. I, I guess my concern is I'm, I'm open to it potentially being, you know, run by the government. Like, I, like it, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a huge fan of CNN and all of that. I just don't think going let the government do it will automatically solve for problems. Like, the, the issues of having it being weaponized, the issue of it being politicized to favor a particular viewpoint or to favor a particular candidate – going, well, we'll just have the government do it. I mean, the government's appointed by the president or it's done by Congress. So either way, I, I don't know that that will obviate the problems we're outlining. But I think that allowing, I mean, I, I've kind of already said this, but having a corporate media outlet with advertising in the middle of it with entities that, you know, if you are financially incentivized to not ask questions that hurt your sponsors, that's a problem if you're running the debates. And I think there's a fair way to do this, even if it were to be an independent commission that's completely separate from government. There is nothing independent about CNN running this thing. Well, so the, CNN is here because they are the way station that could be agreed upon by the two campaigns. Yeah, and they're otherwise leaving out they were three not, other Biden, campaigns. Biden was not going to debate unless he got what he wanted out of the debate. And that means it's early. So he can, you know, put a, a fork in the road and try to change the narrative of this race, which right now is not going well for him comparatively to other incumbents. That it was on CNN, which will not, you know, Trump does not feel will be fair to him. And so he would have to, in Trump's mind, walk into the, the lion's den, that it would not have a, a audience and that they would cut mics. Like that, those are, and you don't think the candidates having that level of control over the debate is a bad thing. But unless you're compelling candidates to debate each other, yeah, let's compel them. Okay, so that's but that th- that is a line that we do need to that we do need to to cross. There is we need to determine. Okay, well, which candidates are we compelling to debate? I think if you have ballot access and you can win numerically, you're in the debate. I mean, we've said this before. And right now, because of the way this is structured, because they're saying pretty please to Trump and Biden, we're excluding people that could mathematically win this election. And I think that's it's doing a huge disservice sure. to this country. I, I think we are, we are talking about two different issues yeah. here, though. They're, they're, Not really, they're, though. We're talking about control of the debate. And I think there are, also, there's a lot of issues. right now, and this was one of the things that the uh, RFK campaign was right to challenge. They were wrong to challenge the fact that they would have made the debate stage because they didn't cross the 15% Yeah, he's threshold. only on six states, I think. Well, but nobody is. That's the thing that I think they are right on, is that right now, we're not at the point, this is so early in the process, yeah. we're not at the point where anybody are officially on the ballots. Uh, we, there is, we know that Republicans get access, we know that Democrats get access automatically, but officially, that has not been decided. And so, what the RFK campaign was saying was that in F- FCC rules... I forget the exact terminology that CNN used, like designated nominees or presumptive nominees was, is not in the FEC or FCC 
bylaws. And so therefore, nobody should be on the stage. It is an in-kind donation from CNN to these two campaigns yeah. for having them on. It's not wrong. Which, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to the idea that most people don't want to hear from anybody but those two guys uh, than you guys are, but... I but think it's not that, about, that, that was that was a fair argument from him. But the want thing is a problem because you have other options. And by hiding the other options, you don't know what you want. You don't know if you would want to vote for RFK Jr. or for Cornell West or Jill Stein or Chase Oliver because you're not being introduced to them in these debates. So to say that, like, the American people don't want this, like, how do we know if they're not participating? Like, I just, I'll watch the debate because it's a part of the process, but I think these debates need to be made a more official part of the election process because this winging it thing, um, it's a form of rigging that I just really, so we're, I we're, don't like. We're completely on board that if, if you have ballot access and you could theoretically win, you should be on the debate stage. I 100% agree with you on that. Um, help me get to where we would, we would institutionalize this. Because I don't know what the mechanisms would be. If if a if a president decides not to debate, are they do they I lose think you ballot have to access? Give me more than ten seconds to like tell you how I would plan to like make. We're gonna this have happen. another one of these things. Yeah, like, on, I don't on know. ABC. So I'll tell you what. Little long term storytelling. We'll come back to this the next time that okay. there's a debate that is privately organized between two candidates and yeah. is intentionally going to exclude everybody else. Here's the other thing. Let's say magically RFK did get the FCC to have some teeth and decide that this was an in-kind donation and then the brakes had to be hit on it or RFK had to be added. Biden would just pull out. He just wouldn't do the debate. They don't want to legitimize RFK and they have their right to say we don't, unless we agree to debate, we're not going to. I think it's wrong. Yeah. Well, glad we didn't do a topic on that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Julian Assange. Let's talk about this guy. WikiLeaks founder Assange has been released from a British prison and traveled to Northern Marianas Islands to plead guilty to conspiracy charges as part of a deal with the U.S. Justice Department. The agreement concludes Assange's prolonged legal ordeal linked to the disclosure of classified documents. Assange uh, is charged with conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defense information and has officially entered his guilty plea. Following the court proceedings, he will return to Australia, his home country. This plea deal marks a significant development in the case that has attracted global attention. Jen. Yes. Time to celebrate. I'm celebrating. I think it's about goddamn time um, that he be released. I read the plea agreement and there's a lot of people saying that, you know, he's he's being um, convicted of journalism. It actually turns out that what he's being convicted of is trying to help Chelsea Manning break a password in the Department of Defense. So it wasn't actually the publishing that he's pleading guilty to, but it was attempting to break this password, which apparently he wasn't even able to do. But the man has essentially served, um, well... If you want to take the whole timeline, 14 years, because he did have to hide in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven. Effectively under house arrest. Yeah, for a really long time. And then he was in a maximum security prison for almost six years in, in, in Great effectively Britain. effectively solitary confinement, which yep. seemed to have a massive psychological and physiological toll on the man because it's hours indistinguishable from, uh, from t uh, torture. Yeah, yeah, 23 hours a day. And so even though, um, you know, he's chosen not to fight this one charge, I think he's fought enough. And it's, it's part of the agreement of just, hey, I get to go away. And I think the, the agreement is he goes back to Australia and, and now he is clear of his obligation to the United States. Yeah. And um, and it's interesting because I had it and I'm, I've decided not to air her name because it was a private conversation. But I did have a conversation with a, a D.C. based journalist about this because she had posted something on her Instagram where she was like, he's getting such a sweet deal. I was like, what kind of journalist would say that Julian Assange is getting a sweet deal after all that she's been through? And she repeated two lies that have been repeated a lot in the last 24 hours. And so I just want to, like, put these to bed. Um, one of the lies was that he was reckless with these releases when Chelsea Manning gave... The WikiLeaks releases. Yeah, yeah. Because those releases were related to... There were four things. The Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, the Gitmo detainees, and there were State Department cables. Mm -hmm. And it was actually not just WikiLeaks. It was Julian Assange personally who reached out to the State Department and said, 
we have these documents. We're going to release them. We would like you to take a look at them first to see if there's anything we don't know. Like, is there any danger to releasing these and to get your comment on this? And Hillary Clinton's State Department said, we're not going to talk to you because we don't want to legitimize you as a journalistic um, I, outlet. I, I don't know whether or not this was just a piece of detritus that flew through my Twitter timeline, but I did see what looked like a highlighted uh, transcript of her asking whether or not they should drone Bob. Oh, no, that was real. Assange. That okay. was real. And the people in the room thought it was a joke and they laughed. And then apparently the people in the room were like, and then she kept talking. And we realized that this was a serious proposal. So she's a creepy bitch. And she, her State Department. Well, she's never previously exercised any type of power or authority to make sure that her own information was tightly held to further ambitions. Yeah. Do you remember that no time when the count. video of, or the picture, the famous picture of the Osama bin Laden raid yeah. came out and she had her hand over her mouth. And the only thing she was upset about is that people thought she might be gasping. She's, yeah. It's like, no, I was, I had a, a knife in my teeth like a pirate. I was screaming and pounding the table, more, more, kill him, more. Yeah, she's, she's. God forbid anyone read any humanity into Hillary Clinton that she might be looking at this raid and, and, and be nervous about it on some level. Yeah. No, she's, um, she's a problematic figure. And by saying no to WikiLeaks, they then set up the talking point that he was recklessly releasing documents. But they did exactly what every other journalist does because this is, you know, every investigative journalist that, I mean, the Pentagon Papers were top secret information that were released to the public. WikiLeaks and Julian Assange did the same thing that the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or any other journalistic publication would do. And they tried to reach out to the offer, government. Offer for comment. Exactly. And they, they refused it. So there's, there's that one. And then the other lie that is being repeated is that WikiLeaks got people killed. And I double-checked this. I took over an hour this morning. And the government has not given one example of a human being that has been hurt or killed because of the Wiki, WikiLeaks disclosures. Um, and yet you see these stenographers for power, these people in the corporate press that are going out there and, like, repeating these things and saying that he's not a journalist and... Um, it's been a very disappointing 24 hours for me to witness the reaction of some people. But for me, I am very grateful that we now know the actions of our soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. I'm grateful that we know the way the Gitmo detainees have been treated. Um, I'm grateful for the information that we know about the DNC, thanks to Wiki WikiLeaks, like the way that their primaries were unfairly run and I think are still unfairly run. This was important information. That was for, that was the dip, that was the 2016 drop after yeah. the the first Assange. Yeah, and Assange was already locked up when they yeah. did that. But like that's the organization that he brought into the world, and when people like uh, you know ex Defense Secretary Bob Gates and others have been asked about the actual effects of WikiLeaks, the word that comes up the most is embarrassed that they embarrassed the people in the government, and then also that it made it less likely that people would want to participate in U.S. government operations because we know the truth about these things. Um, that is not a reason to keep secrets from the American people. So he's one of my journalistic heroes, and I'm happy to see that he's going to have an actual chance at a life. I think he was held in captivity for far too long. And, um, yeah, and I just, to anyone who went out and protested, and I, I have protested on behalf of Julian Assange, I think that the sustained effort all over the world by people who showed up and protested his captivity, I think they deserve a lot of credit and should be very proud today. Heaton, you going to let this Russian disinformation stand? We should drone him. Absolutely. <laughs> drone him. Drone him. I, I broadly agree. I think uh, I, I broadly agree with Jen. Um, I'm not celebrating, but that's because I'm not happy that this even got to the point where we needed to do a plea deal. Yeah. Uh, now, a, a plea deal is not uh, precedential. It doesn't set any court precedent in terms of prosecuting journalists, but it does have a chilling effect. And that's what um, now two presidential, I guess three presidential administrations have been playing around with is – to what extent can we go after this guy? Because it's really irritating. I think the Pentagon Papers are the best corollary to bring up. Um, for people unfamiliar with the Pentagon Papers, this was back during the Nixon uh, administration where a number of uh, uh, papers were leaked from the Pentagon. And it turns out Vietnam was not going as swimmingly as our leaders were telling the American people because it was in the interest of the military and the powers that be to lie to everybody so that we didn't pull out early. 
Um, turns out we were losing the war in newsflash. We did lose the war. The Pentagon Papers were good to let the American people know what was actually happening in Vietnam. And I think that, that is very much the closest corollary to this. Saved a lot of lives. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue that the uh, Obama administration had when, when this started happening was the, the quote-unquote New York Times question which was, we really want to prosecute this guy, but if we do, we'll probably have to prosecute the New York Times for similar stuff. Damn it. Well, we don't want to do that because the New York Times is a good press. Well, also, I mean, that's, a, that's a cope. That's an excuse. Yeah. Because, because really, the, it, it, was, it was the departments that were embarrassed by this. It was the Pentagon and the State Department mm-hmm. and whatever intelligence agencies are mixed in between that hate this shit. Yes. They hate it so much that they get really mad and hold grudges for a really, really, really long time. Now, one might say, maybe don't classify so much shit because this <laughs> is the reason why you let low-level employees leak this stuff to random people on the fucking well, and, internet. And that's, that's the other thing. Is like, here, here's where they have a point. There is something to be said for... First of all, there is something to be said where you as a journalist don't get to break the law. Like, you, you get to publish information that is important to the national conversation, even if that was obtained through illegal means, if somebody else did it. Yes. So if Justin, if Justin gets an, a knife in his mouth and, and repelling equipment and breaks into the Pentagon and steals a filing cabinet and gives it to me and I publish it, I can do that as a journalist. Justin might go to jail, but I'm, yes. I'm not on the hook for that. I am protected by the freedom of the press. Th- this goes back a long ways. And You're, Chelsea Manning was prosecuted. Yeah, and, and also pardoned by President Obama for ver- a variety of other reasons we can get into. Um, so... You're not allowed to break the law. So that is to say that, like, uh, Julian Assange trying to hack into the Pentagon, that is illegal. That's something you could be prosecuted on. I would say, given that he'd been in uh, solitary confinement in a British prison combined with uh, um, exile slash a house arrest for a, a dozen years, he's effectively served the sentence. I probably wouldn't have done anything anyway. Which now the American Department of Justice agrees with you on. Yes, yeah. Well, like, uh, so, so there, there, there's a little bit there. I will also give, like, the, the, the part of this that has the most cognitive distance for me is one of the 18 counts, so 17 of the counts that he was brought up on uh, by, by American... Uh, uh, the Trump administration. By, by the Trump administration, thank you. Yeah. 17 to the 18 were from the Espionage Act. The, the, the one thing um, that's not in the Espionage Act is what Jen is uh, talking about of the trying to break in, uh, the, the, the trying to compromise a, a government computer, which, you know, b- violated the That'll law. That'll get you. Could, That'll get could, you. Could yeah. be prosecuted And that's all on, they but, got them on. Yeah. So, um, uh, spoiler, that's every four episodes of the Darknet Diaries podcast yeah. where some 16-year-old has hopped up on Mountain Dew Code Red and yeah. tries to hack the <laughs> Pentagon and accidentally does it. The, 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 the 17 <laughs> counts on the Espionage Act... I, the Espionage Act makes me very uncomfortable. I, I, I do think that Assange is... I, I would need to do more research to fully flush this out, but my, my bearings tell me that it is contravened to press freedom, uh, that, that um, having a transparent press that does not require the permission of the government to publish things about the government is foundational to American First, uh, First Amendment principles, and that's contravened to the, uh, the Espionage Act that, that Assange was primarily prosec- or was going to be prosecuted under if, if, he'd, if he'd been over early. Um, the, the, the one bit where I'm like, okay, there's a point here is redacting names. I've not done the full research on this. Jen, it sounds like you've done a little bit more research in terms of they at least wanted comment from the State Department. I can understand a governmental position, like, fuck the government if it just has egg on its face for fucking shit up. Fuck Hell the government. Yeah. Um, you know, where they, like, we're doing great in Iraq, turns out no. Right? Fuck that. That's the American people deserve to know. I do get situations where we have specific local assets in Iraq that are doing, uh, that are working with the American government and they're going to be killed. That's a situation where I'm like, okay, I, under, I understand why there's some security issues there, but that's one so out let of me, the... Let me pause you on that because I actually looked into the details. During Chelsea Manning's trial, they tried to say that there was a person that was working with us in Afghanistan who had been killed because of the WikiLeaks documents. But then they did a search, and that person had been killed. They did a search, and that person's name had never been mentioned in the WikiLeaks oh, documents. Okay. And that's the only, that's, the, that's the closest they ever came. All right. Um, uh, that actually surprised me, too, because I'm assuming a lot of these people just died naturally anyway. I'm surprised they couldn't find some kind of... But good good to know that yeah. nobody died as a result of this. Um, I, I think that the timeline that's happened here most recently is uh, the... Bi- well, let me just add the caveat that we know of. Th- that but if of. they knew of anything, you know they would say it. Wait, 
we, we the, 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 the caveat that I'm inserting that, is... I think we can reasonably suspect that, but we don't know. The, the few instances where I am okay with there being an opaque level of information with the American people, and it, they're very few and far between, but there are rare instances where it makes sense. If, if there were um, documents within uh, the Department of Defense or the Department of the Interior, the State Department of these are critical... Really, reasonably defenseless infrastructure points in America that we have assessed as national security people. We're worried, like the the Hoover Dam. Actually, you could take it out if you put a dynamite keg right here. That kind of thing. That's a legitimate thing for the government to be doing. I don't have a problem with that being opaque because that is information that could be um, that could be used to to cause widespread damage. Um, names that are going to be compromised, resulting in their death. That's fine. But again, here we're talking about at most one out of the 17 counts that were brought up under the Espionage Act. The other 16 are all, it's making it difficult for America to prosecute a war effort, or it's uh, empowering America's enemies abroad. And, And my response to that is, well, I would rather be the good guy. Like, I would rather just like, why don't we just let everybody know what's actually happening so that the American people can make a decision and we do the right thing as opposed to wait to find out what the military or the president wants us to know. I think where we're at now is I think that the Biden administration was embarrassed into having to do this, into having to make the plea deal. The reason I say that is that uh, Journalists Without Borders now ranks the United States 55th in terms of press freedom, which is an embarrassment to the American people. And what the Biden administration effectively had to do was go, uh, Britain is about to debate whether or not they can release Assange to the United States on on the merits of whether or not he has sufficient First Amendment and press freedom. So another country was going to have to grade America on our own constitution. And that was going to be really, really embarrassing to the administration if we failed that metric. Well, and especially because during that conversation, they were going to bring up how many people we've tortured. Yes, there's all sorts. Of of, so the Biden administration went, okay, well, let's, let's work out this plea deal. Uh, but I don't think it should have even gotten to the plea deal. I think like... Um, you know, maybe maybe early on in this process, before he'd done a dozen years uh, in in a punitive uh, of measure where his freedom was severely curtailed, maybe on on the one count we brought up of uh, trying to break into a computer. But it, at this point, I think it's basically trying to have your cake and eat it too, of not having to get egg on our face from the British court system while simultaneously letting journalists know that we will kind of come after you if you piss us off. Journalistically. The, the problem here isn't whether or not he's a journalist, although obviously I do think that there is a chilling effect on some level of uh, your government saying if you fuck with us, we will either through omission or active punishment try to make your life miserable. The larger issue is that the dog is out of the house when it comes to all of this. Julian Assange is a very quaint figure. He is somebody that is a hacktivist, essentially. Uh, and I consider that journalism because I think it's hard to define what exactly journalism is, but at least he's somebody that wanted to be a political figure. He wanted to be seen as a free speech advocate. He didn't accidentally, oops, fall over and, and turn into this. He steered into the skid and wanted to make himself a figure. That in our brain feels very rebellious, you know, somewhere between V for Vendetta and the Pentagon Papers. That's where Julian Assange kind of, intentionally made his brand after all of this but we're so far beyond that now it was only what a year ago that we had the dude leaking pentagon papers to his discord because he wanted (laughs) the 17 year olds there to to like him more uh when when we covered that story somebody emailed us and was like hey you want to cover something interesting go to the world of tanks forum world of tanks is a free-to-play game where you do tank combat the fights get so intense in the world of tanks forums that there's been multiple militaries that have been compromised because when one dude is saying, no, this tank wouldn't move like that, it doesn't have that kind of radius, and someone's like, fuck you, bullshit, proof, they'll leak the schematics (laughs) of the tanks into the forum because they want to win an argument. My larger point is this. Stop classifying so much shit. Yeah. The government, for its own benefit, needs to be better. And I'm specifically talking to the Pentagon and the State Department. Declassify stuff. Put it out. You're probably going to be an administration or two away 
from the last time that, that something like that happened. Take the minor embarrassment now than the mega embarrassment of this stuff happening on a larger and larger scale because it's only going to get worse. It's not like there's less ways that people can spread this information. It's not like there's less uh, of, uh, of an ability to disseminate it. This is only going to keep happening. Julian Assange is an old version of this. We are 15 years past what that problem is for the government, for their own benefit. Routinely declassify stuff that isn't of critical national security. And I you know, like the remaining 10,000 pages of the JFK assassination that's maybe, still not been yeah, declassified. Maybe, right? And, and I think the reason why is because... The CIA did it. Well, that's, that's JFK <laughs> stuff. Uh, the reason why, and I hate to, to kind of use the term, but it is the deep state. It is the fact that you have permanent bureaucrats in a lot of these offices that just stay there no matter who the administration is. And they're the ones that are like, well, I, I was involved in this in the past. And so they get way too squirrely about stuff. There needs to be a more routine bloodletting of information in our government. Uh, it is for the best interest of these organizations, of the State Department, well, like, of the past. Also, a significant amount of this is the government getting butthurt about being embarrassed. Yes. Like, that's a significant amount. Like, again, this happened with the Pentagon Papers. The, the Pentagon and the Nixon administration didn't want to come out and say we're losing the war in Vietnam. They didn't want that because they were afraid that it would end up causing us to allocate less funding to the military to prosecute the war in Vietnam or perhaps have more uh, draft avoidance. And so they lied to the American people. And we've seen similar things with Afghanistan very fucking recently, yeah. very fucking recently of this. You know what? We're going to pull out. Everything's going to be fine. And uh, uh, that kind of stuff should be brought before the American people. Like, How we, we haven't had a, a, a big report on what the fuck happened yes. in the Afghanistan pullout. I mean, hell, the, the whole war. Like, like it, it should be a... a I think it would be very much in the interest of the country for us to do just a big. A and by the way, this is one of the, one. the Assange I things is, is that, that uh, quickly, one of the Assange things that they were pissed off about was the, the sheer amount of papers he brought up of the Taliban's involved with the Pakistani government, which yeah. was our ally at the time. Yeah. We didn't yeah. want anybody knowing that because God, God forbid that we were working out any kind of deal with the Pakistan behind or with, with the Taliban, Taliban behind closed doors yeah. like we fucking did here about two years ago yeah. when we pulled out and when I guess we're at peace with the Taliban now. Yeah, um, Justin, the report on Afghanistan, I remember watching testimony about it. The inspector general, I can't remember his name, he was a good dude, um, but he did a huge report, which I, was actually one of the catalysts okay. for pulling out. It was, it was fascinating stuff, but he basically just reported that we were losing for a very, very long time. And he was doing report after report after report, but one of them just got to be like too much. And yeah. so, um, you know, we weren't paying attention to this because we're America, but like, yeah, we knew that we were losing. But I think one of the reasons that conversation started and why Congress was on asking for these reports, I think in part was the WikiLeaks documents yeah. getting out because we started asking questions. We weren't just saying like, oh, we're winning. We're And so that's why I think those documents were so important and they're, is a chilling effect um, because I think when, you know, Edward Snowden had the opportunity to leak documents, mm -hmm. he felt the need to flee. And I think one of the reasons was because he saw what, what happened, happened with Julian Assange. Assange. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I do have to wonder how many instances there have been after that where an employee of the government or a contractor has the opportunity to do this and decided not to knowing that they'd either be imprisoned for a decade and a half or have to become a Russian or, you know, the, the effect, I mean, I get nervous sometimes. I mean, I'm just covering Congress, but like I, when you're fucking with the most powerful people in the world and you see what they've done to no people. no sense of humor or uh, a recourse for any embarrassment. Yeah. It's like they get embarrassed and they'll hunt this guy down for 15 years. Um, and at the end of the day, they have him trying to hack a password um, it, it has a chilling effect. It really does. And I think that is the goal. So there we go. But That's good luck to Julian Assange. We have to get, uh, all of our information from Thug Shaker Central. Mm -hmm. Patreon.com slash we're not wrong this week. We're going to be talking about Hillary Clinton. She's got a new book out. 
Yay. Who reads these books? <laughs> is this just money laundering? Like, why did she have a Stephen King esque uh, bibliography of books? We're going to be talking about political books and Hillary Clinton's book specifically. <laughs> I was just blown away that I see it's like, oh, Hillary. Clinton. Why are we hearing from Hillary Clinton again? Is it just election season? No, book to promote. Yep. Another book for Hillary, as if anybody... Have you read any Hillary books? I've read, like, a chapter of what really happened or whatever the book was. What, that came uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, because that was one of the biggest wastes of fucking time. Did you read <laughs> it? Goddamn life, yes. God. Which is so fucked up, because she's such a vindictive lunatic that if she actually wrote a book that was, like, for real, I would love it. Oh yeah, my see, that, that's my yeah. thing. Is Hillary's like, actual, has she actual read the book? Because I'm pretty sure it was ghost written. Save yeah. it for the Patreon, yeah. boys. Yeah. This, oh, is this is what you pay for. This is what you pay for. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, journalism. The old gray lady, the paper of record. The New York Times is working to move its top podcast behind a paywall, according to people familiar with the matter at the Wall Street Journal. As the company seeks a fresh revenue boost from the audio format, the publisher is exploring making only the three most recent episodes of The Daily available to non-subscribers and putting its serial show completely behind a paywall. I think they should put it completely in the trash. <laughs> Hasn't been good since the host wanted to fuck the murderer. Was this the same serial from like 2014? Yes. And then they um... decided, let's stop doing anything interesting that everybody liked us for. Yeah, I didn't and know also, it was still let's a thing. let's totally ignore the fact was, that it was Serial was New York Times? Uh, Not it in was the beginning. Independent, then it got purchased. Oh, okay. Uh, funny aside. So, uh, World's Greatest Con launching, and we have friends who know people, and uh, they're like, uh, oh, this is really good. You should talk to my friend Ira, Ira Glass, of This American Life. Mm. And so we're like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll talk to Ira. And uh, Ira mm. writes an email. He says, well, sounds great. What I would suggest to you is that you sell this podcast to the New York Times. That's what I did with my podcast, Serial. Hit what? <laughs> and I was like, well, well I, Ira Glass said that? Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Ira Glass was Serial? No. Yes. I yes. don't think Ira Glass no. was Serial. Not the original one. You're thinking of This American Life, right? That was a offshoot of This American oh, Life. Oh, okay. Serial is an offshoot of This American Life. Okay, so it was produced by him, but yes. there was a host that was, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, because I remember that woman. She spoke at one of the podcast movements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, she was, was not produced, Ira Glass. It was produced by, it was a spinoff of This American Life, Serial. Oh, so when I was in New York doing stand-up comedy, I would have like relatives and friends back in Oklahoma say, you know what you should do? You should go on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be really good for your career. You'd get a lot of exposure. And I'd be like, oh, wow. I, you know what? I'm going to walk into Lauren's office tomorrow and I be know. like, hey, I think I should come on your show. Yeah, thank you for the advice. Thanks for the advice, gang. Yeah, yeah we, we, people we, keep telling me, Jen, you would be great on the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I should, should just, just go just there. Just give him a call. He's in the yellow pages. He's yeah. hurting for content. <laughs> it's like when I, when I made the card game, uh, people would be like, like, oh, you should be on Shark Tank. Have you thought about going on Shark Tank? Mm hmm. It's like, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll get right on it. By the way, subscribers are expected to be able to listen the, to the shows across podcast platforms such as uh, Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts, but the Times would continue to sell ads against the podcasts that are in front of the paywall. This is being driven by the fact that podcast advertising growth is slowing. It increased to $1.9 billion after years of double-digit gains, so that was an anemic boost, according to the Interactive Advertising Bureau and PricewaterhouseCooper. Amid ad market challenges, revenue is projected to grow 12% uh, to more than $2 billion this year and hit nearly 26 by 2026. So, Mr. Andrew Heaton, is pay first, listen later, the future of podcasting? This is crazy. It's completely unprecedented. It's almost like having a subscription to read the newspaper. Mm. I can't fathom that such a model would ever work where you have to pay in advance to read the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Newspapers are always free. Yeah, th this could well be the case. I mean, I, I think that we're we're in a weird period right now. We, I think last week we discussed kind of the decline of local journalism, and uh, my position on that remains we're going to have to come up with a new model. I don't think the existing models are, are going to cover the spread on it. Um, the, the options we have are pretty limited. Uh, and... Uh, something like this doesn't terribly surprise me because we already had subscription models going back quite some time with uh, publications like the New York Times. The New York Times 
as I recall, until I finally buckled and got a New York Times subscription, because I have to read it frequently for this show, uh, they would give you like five articles a month or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I thought about getting a VPN, and then one of my colleagues here on the couch said that it would be inappropriate to be stealing journalistic content when asking people to pay me money on Patreon, and mm. I went, God damn it, Jen's right. I have to, uh, I have to now get a <laughs> subscription to the New York Times or be a hypocrite. So I did that. Um, yeah, so th- this, this makes sense to me. And, like, the, the issue with the paywall podcast model would be if you are a newcomer, that would be a death sentence. If you do not have a large audience that you can convert to it, if you don't have name brand recognition, starting out on Patreon would be nuts. Um, there was like a year where I became like the horse whisperer for middle-aged men that wanted to start podcasts or YouTube channels. I would just get random calls from dudes that I hadn't heard of in like like nine years that were like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well as an insurance adjuster, but I'm thinking about starting a podcast. Like, what? can you tell me how to do that full-time? And I'd be like, okay. And I'd give them advice and they'd go, um, all right, so like, like how many episodes should I wait until I, I, I monetize it on Patreon? Like two, three? What do you think? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I would go a couple years probably if you don't have any audience to speak of to begin with. Um, so if you're new, this model wouldn't work. Uh, if, if you're new, you're going to have to get out and get your name there. But for the New York Times, that is a well-established newspaper. People know what it is. Um, it, it might make sense for them. Jen? Um. What's is the question? Is this is the future pay of podcasting? First, listen later. The future of the industry that we all make our living in. I mean, I don't plan on doing that um, because I have a goal that's not make as much money as I possibly can. But my goal is to tell people what's going on in Congress, and I think that's a a mission that apparently I don't share with the New York Times because if I I've been told for years that I should lock up at least some of my episodes or follow up information or like you know, put a bunch of stuff behind the paywall to get people yeah. to pay me more. And I know that people would pay me more if I did so, but I want the information out there. That's my goal. If your goal is only to make money in the, the New York Times and like go ahead and lock up the daily. But at the same time, I started listening to the daily, I don't know, maybe six months ago. It's pretty yeah. good. But what the daily has done has made me use my New York Times subscription more often than I otherwise would have in order to read the investigations that the Daily is highlighting. So it was serving as advertising for the New York Times, and if they lock it up behind a paywall, I'm not listening to it anymore. And I'm not going to be able to share it to people and say, like, yeah. oh, hey, like, the New York Times did this it really totally interesting... and shareability. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, so if I want to share the information... And say, like, you should get a New York Times subscription because this is the type of work they're doing. This is the investigation that they did. They're absolutely killing my ability to do that marketing for them. So it's just if your mission is to get information out through your podcast, locking it all up behind a paywall for reasons in addition to what Andrew said, like you can't just go out and be like, hey, I'm going to charge you for a thing you've never tried before. Um, I, I don't think that locking up everything behind a paywall serves that mission well. So I'm, I'm disappointed in the New York Times, and I think this is going to backfire on them. I don't think they realize how much advertising the paper gets from their podcasts. The, the model that I have on the political orphanage is the meal is free and available to everybody. The dessert is behind the paywall. Exactly. And, um, and you know, like, like sometimes I'll have a – I've got a guest coming on here in a bit where um, this is a fortnight or three weeks ahead – where I have a tax expert on, and it's actually a surprisingly interesting conversation about taxes. We talk about taxes for like an hour and a half. I finally get to talk about Georgism at some point. And then at the end, I'm like, hey, can I, can I be honest with you? I really just have this one question I really want to ask you. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, it's not a good question. And he's like, what is it? And I'm like, can strippers deduct boob jobs? Is that doable? And he's like, I, and I'm like, hold on, can we do a bonus episode on this? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, can we just do a bonus episode where I just figure out how to get in on the graft and ask you questions about strippers and boob jobs? And he's like, yeah. So like that kind of thing yeah. where you're, you're enticing, like the listeners, yeah. they, get the, they get the content and then you go, like Justin and I did one last year that was a lot of fun where I called Justin and I was like, do you just want to listen to tapes of Richard Nixon drunk dialing people? Yeah. And it like it's not like substantive, but fuck, it was, it was fun. fun. Yeah. yeah, and like you and I did a episode of my Patreon at South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. We oh, had yeah. a couple drinks and just chit chatted, and like yeah, that's yeah. the type of stuff where you're not. I mean, maybe you'll learn stuff because like you know you just have factoids that come spilling out of your face, mm-hmm. but it's not you know clips from Congress that 
You know, it, there is a difference between the fluff and the... Yeah, and I, I, I look at it like for patrons that support the show who allow me to feed myself and put neckties on my dog, like that is that is the treat <laughs> As that the I'm, framers intended. As the framers intended. Mm-hmm. That's the treat I'm giving them. It's the dessert, you know? So they're, it's like, but it makes it easier for me because I'm a little bit more casual. I swear more. I'm, I'm dry right now, but... Last year was drunk a lot <laughs> while, <laughs> while doing the bonus episodes. Like a friend would come over, we split a bottle of wine. And, but it, but it's, it's a thing where, you know, again, you're getting the meat up front and then you're going, hey, if you just want to dick around with me behind the paywall, sure. we're going to be dicking around behind the paywall. I think each podcast is different. Each monetary solution is different. I think that this one is going to kill cereal. And maybe, I didn't maybe know cereal was still a thing. They just did a thing on Gitmo, actually. Huh. Uh, still not going to listen to it, but. Huh. If you that's what we needed. The cereal girls <laughs> cracking the Gitmo story. I should probably stop shitting on this because, like, this is a small industry. And we shouldn't be this <laughs> fucking dismissive about a gigantic titan of, uh, uh, of, of, of the world that we make our living in. So I, I apologize. I'm being, too, I'm being too harsh. That being said, I think that it's going to kill that show because the listenership's going to plummet. Yeah. It's not going to drive the same kind of revenue because you need to be constantly reminded why you need a subscription in the modern day and age. And I think that it is way better, at least for me, for shows that I love to say, I am always going to get this, but I get a little extra. I really love this. I would put out, I'd listen to anything that they did. I'm willing to pay for the privilege to make sure that that's the case. I don't think that timed releases motivate paywall jump i don't think that exclusive necessarily motivated i don't think that anybody thinks about getting an audible subscription so they can listen to the exclusive podcast and there's a lot of really good stuff that audible does that they throw that they throw behind their paywall uh, i just think it's it's podcasting is radio it is a derivative of radio and we found in this country that radio is best enjoyed as a unifying thing that is largely free and is either degraded on some level with ads or you have people pay for it like NPR, something like that. But the one common denominator is it's free. I think it's bad for the daily because I think you're, you're right. They do a lot of really good stuff. And if the daily instead was like, Hey, subscribe to the New York times uh, podcast feed, the New York times, whatever. uh, And the daily now is an extra segment. We do our big segment we do our, here's the other things in the news. And then if you are a time subscriber, you get another shorter little thing that just tells you about another story that we are covering in the times and dedicate a producer to only do that. I'd subscribe. Yeah. I like the daily. I think the daily is really good. Uh, uh, Well, and their solution of having, you know, like three, their three most episodes, recent episodes being free and then the lock of everything else I don't think they realize how many, like I looked at my um, podcast subscriptions today, stuff that I, I don't always listen to it, but like, like I haven't listened to your shows in a very long time there. I subscribe to them, but I also hang out with you. I know I'm the worst code that we give each other grace (laughs) that we don't listen to each other's show. I know it is nice, but I think I have approximately 25 shows on my list. And if I'm not listening to two of my, you know, close friends, I'm not listening to the daily Every single day. It's just not how my habits work. So sometimes it'll be like, I'm in the mood for the daily and I'll listen to five. Yeah. And so if you're only putting three out there, I'm going I'm to Michael miss your Bono. content. I know. I like his voice. But I'm going to miss your content because you're not going to allow me to binge and go through the topics that I wanted to. And sometimes I'll share something that's two months old, but that's when I got to it. So if you're taking that ability away from me. It, it just, I think it's short-sighted. Uh, it is one of many very silly moves that newspapers make. Because they, again, this is like the biggest thing that I I think is just a mistaken idea. Newspapers believe they should have had hard paywalls in 1996. The second that that they came up with websites, they feel that the reason why newspapers are in the situation that they're in is because they didn't have a paywall immediately. I think that is stupid. (laughs) It is among the dumbest ideas and it is corrosive and bad for good content. Like I'm rooting for the New York times in the same way that I'm rooting for the Washington post. While I will criticize them. I do think that these brands fucking matter. They should be something that people trust. uh, And that's why I do criticize them. But serial is an important show. 
This American Life is an, is, is an important show. These are uh, uh, shows that are brought up under the New York Times. The The Daily is a really, really, really good show. It mm-hmm. really set the, a bar, a high bar for what, how well a show that is turned around in 24 hours can sound like. And a lot of them aren't. I mean, they have more of a lead time. But some well, of they have are. multiple hosts, but just the... It's a half hour and you get a good story and you get the details and you can trust that they've fact checked it. And it's, it's a good way to get the news. I'm, I think this is a a sad thing. Yeah. It's, it's silly, but, uh, it leaves more listeners for the rest of us. (laughs) So, so sad. I mean, if this is the new way of podcasting, that's great for us because I missed 2012 when there were like. 10 podcasts and mine was one of them. And so I was easily I, I, found. I, I do think that the larger story here beyond what the New York times is doing is that advertising itself is dying. Yeah. yeah. And we are I, seeing I that die the, in a bunch of different ways. That's the big one. I mean, like to go back to the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll back up way back. Uh, when I graduated college, um, I, I was in, um, Oxford for six months doing data entry. It was not a particularly fun job, but I listened to an entire back catalog. I, like I basically took, I audited an entire semester's worth of courses from Stanford while doing uh, a data entry because I could have my headphones on. Most of them were journalistic. And so I was hearing classes in journalism from like 2006 because there's a little bit of a lag. And all of them were, all of them were freaking out about the death of the newspaper industry around 2006 or so. They were all like, everybody was like, we immediately need government funding or we have to order people to read newspapers or something. We're all going to die. And um, the, the, can we elect Obama again? The, the, Cause that, that's on a lot of newspapers. Can we just do it every year, yeah. twice a year? But like, like the, the thing that they were dealing with at the time was revenue of newspapers was 40% advertising. It was, it was, that was, that was 40%, about half of the revenue for newspapers came from, uh, the classified advertisements where you, you buy a couch or whatever and Facebook and Craigslist and everything else came in and just completely destroyed that profit model and it forced them to scramble. And in the last few years, we've seen for whatever reason, the amount of money that you get from advertisements and audio and on YouTube crater as well. And in, in the business that we're in, and I would argue really any business, you either have breadth or you have depth in terms of your client base. My show is a depth-based show. I have a narrow, elite group of people that allow me to to do my life, and I have a personal rapport with them, and I message them, and I look at their comments on Patreon, and I like it. That's a good model for me. I don't have a giant breadth model. The breadth model works really well. You get a ton of people, and then you, you sell advertising. You make a lot of money on it. But the, the problem that, that that model, which is dominant right now, is going through is that the money on advertising is drying up, and that's forcing everybody to scramble, including the New York Times. Yeah. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. Clever girl. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com is where you send us your email. Hey, listen here, Mr. Writes. Did you really call Jen Aaron Brockovich within five minutes of starting an episode about deep fakes? Uh, and so we have a new piece of uh, uh, art. Uh, this, I think, is old fashioned. Photoshop. This is not AI, uh, or or maybe it is. I don't know. It let's, looked AI to there. me. There we go. Jen Briney is congressional dish based on a true story, and that is Julia Roberts as Erin Brockovich with Jen Briney's face. Jen, uh, do you think this is a new look for you? It's making me think I might need a new hairstyle because it kind of works. It looks good. I know. It looks good. I look really hot with someone else's body. <laughs> That's what I need. It's Julia Roberts' body. Uh, testing for weaknesses, writes, Velociraptors were small, but right after Jurassic Park was released, the Utah raptor was discovered. Not only was it the size of a dinosaur from the movie, it was also discovered in the same region as, as the dig from the beginning of Jurassic Park. Yeah, if you think dinosaurs are older than 6,000 years old. 
<laughs> By the way, we got a lot of Jurassic Park nerds. Nice. Really, <laughs> nice. Was saying no, Jurassic Park wasn't a lie. It was a specific science fiction plot line where they were engineering dinosaurs, so they had mm. no hold to what dinosaurs actually you know what, were. In the Michael Crichton book, they even go more in depth on that, on like the, they had to change the dinosaur schematics because the humidity and gravity is slightly different yes. now than it was during the Jurassic. And so, and then also like the, the much more evil John Hammond character yeah. in Jurassic Park, it like intentionally made the dinosaurs slower so that they would fit the mental model. Uh, like he, he designed them to fit what people think of dinosaurs. So I conceded, nerds. Conceded. Uh, uh, also, it, the movie doesn't do the best. My favorite scene of that book, which is right at the beginning, it might, in, in fact, be the first words that you read, which is John Hammond going to a board of, I assume, a venture capital or some bank or something where he's trying to secure the money for Jurassic Park, and he just brings this horrifying super early prototype dinosaur that essentially just croaks and then uh, dies and everybody's kind of revulsed, but they're like, yeah, that looks like a dinosaur here. We're going to give you a bunch of money. But I always thought that Jurassic park as a startup, I thought was really, uh, <laughs> really funny. Thank you for your non service rights. It's the fall of 2000. My music school buddies are raking in the ROTC loot and they convinced me to sign up. I meet with the recruiter and he says, I, I can't help but notice your addiction. Do you sing? I smugly reply, why, yes, I do. The recruiter responds excitingly, me too, I can tell. You're a tenor, right? Now I'm a baritone. That almost ended it right there. And that slight end the difficulty in placing me in one of the top three choices, training, doctrine, command, general staff, or horse cavalry, what? led me to part ways. I missed out on serving in the war on terror, and I have to admit now, very occasionally, I do sing tenor. If Heaton had signed up 100% certain, he would have been in the same unit. Is there like a barbershop quartet unit or like a cool college a cappella group unit we could have joined? Because that sounds pretty fun. Of which uh, I would be chaplain. You've <laughs> been homeschooled, right? Uh my bias is that we've homeschooled our two children. One is an army NCO currently deployed to Kuwait, quote unquote. The other is an engineer at NASA working on the Artemis project. You're welcome, America. Certainly homeschooling is not right for every child, but if we are going to consider doing away with it, let there be one set of rules. If we can find a child not really being educated via their homeschool, that homeschool should shut down. If we find a parent who is bad at teaching, that homeschool should shut down. Of course, the same rules would apply to public schools and school teachers. One set of rules for everyone. Fail and you're shut down. I'm sure public education is nothing to fear. Sounds fair to me. You know, that was... When I was in Florida public education, uh, Jeb at the time was putting in what would essentially be the framework of what nationally is no child left behind, but it was grades, letter grades for each school based on standardized tests, what was called the FCAT. And it was very unpopular with all of my teachers. They were very, very mad about the idea that they would have to teach to a test and this would ruin the educational experience. But the point of it was to give you some kind of idea of what schools are doing very well and what schools are, are not. And I think that that still remains controversial. Yeah. I think an interesting thought experiment is let's say that presently the majority of education in the country were private it were home schools, parochial schools, um, private schools, boarding schools, whatever and it had the same cost and outcome, I think we would see a tremendous amount of articles saying that this is clearly a market failure that needs to be nationalized. But when we see the same kind of output under the current system, we do not have that same model in our head. We, we go, oh, it's a funding issue. Yeah. Failing, or sorry, falling smoking rates, right? Two of the most impactful reasons for cutting smoking rates was the laws banning smoking indoors and the anti-smoking education delivered in schools. I forget the name of the organization, but they were sending second and third grade me home with VHS tapes about people with missing jaws, voice boxes, and crying young adults whose parents died smoking. Scare the children and get the guilt of scaring your child to death to make you quit. Yeah, I, I mean, there were a lot of different things that led to the decline of smoking. You can't say that any one thing in isolation is the reason that it happened. So, yeah, there were different factors. I just think that banning advertising was one of the factors. I don't know if I agree with the 
the, 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 the children outreach stuff because the one that I remember the most when I was growing up was dare. And all it did was introduce me to the concept of a lot of drugs that I would eventually do. Yeah. Like they were, they were very, they it was made, a drug education program. Yeah. Like, Ooh, that one sounds fun. Like, like, <laughs> like when you're on cocaine, you're really focused and kind of hyper. Like, let's say you're kind of tired, but you don't want to be anymore. Cocaine. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys ever do the candy cigarettes? Rod, the ice cream man, had them. And, like, you would puff on them, and then, like, a little bit of sugar would yeah. come out, and you looked super cool. I don't think we had... Maybe. maybe. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I liked those. Bring back smoking for others, writes. I remember ads for cigarettes and whatnot. I never smoked, but I do think actors and characters in movies and shows and comics look really cool when they're smoking. <laughs> I miss smoking in entertainment. I have family members who smoked, like my grandparents and uncles, but I never wanted to. Maybe I'm just the exception that proves the rule. I would say no, that's that's the exact same thing. I've never been a regular smoker, but I I liked when people were able to smoke in bars and restaurants. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah. This 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 is my uh my government shouldn't coerce people credentials crumbling before your eyes. I, I like the smoking bans. I I my, my quality of life's increased quite a lot. I also um I, I think that a significant um, uh, part of why people smoke is it looks cool. And I also fucking hate that the same people that think it looks cool think it looks really cool to flick when they're done. Fuck you, cigarette. I'm oh, done yeah, with you. The Fuck littering. you. And you're fucking litter. And I'm sorry. If you litter, you're trash. Period. It doesn't matter <laughs> if you crumple up a beer can on your head and dump it in front of your home, or if you throw out cigarette. If if you throw, I'm not saying smokers, but if you're a smoker who litters cigarette butts, you're a trash person, and you should be forced to eat it. What about? If it goes in the like grate, in like the sewer grate or something like that, it's even worse. Depends where the sewer's going. Is it going into the ocean? Is it going into the like? I don't I know. Don't know. Yeah. Are you are up to date on where all the sewer lines let's, go? Let's they default go into on trash. Yeah, You're trash still trash. And so you, would say, you would say trash. Don't fucking litter. This isn't hard. But for some reason, like a significant amount of smokers believe yeah. that cigarettes don't count and that they look cool when they flick them. And what I'm saying is whenever I see you flick it, I see a peasant who, who is deserving of my disdain. And you have willfully decided to do this. I was a little bit of a Karen on some bitch last night. Um, Ooh. I know. But she was sitting behind my building, and I've seen her before. And she smokes one after another, which, like, fine, you do you. But she puts them out right on the ground, and there's an ashtray mm -hmm. six feet away. And so last night I had had enough, and I just said to her, I'm like, excuse me, just so you know, that's an ashtray. And she was like, oh, oh, and like didn't say anything back to me. I think I, I it for, again, her, but for some I, reason they think it doesn't count. They're invisible to them. And it's yeah. like, what? I, I don't and our janitors have to pick it up every day. And I'm like, no, I, just, if I, I just eat wanted McDonald's to know we're and watching. Screw it in front of me like like a wolf or something. Like you would be right and going, can you not leave your McDonald's wrappers all over our yard? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Karen. Mm. Add it up, writes, I teach advertising at the undergraduate and graduate level. Something relevant to the discussion of advertising harmful products is that the general rule that advertising is that it's more effective at generating secondary demand, i.e. demand for specific brands, than it is primary demand, demand for product categories. So cigarette ads probably did a better job convincing people to smoke Marlboros instead of Camels than they did convincing non-smokers to start smoking. This concept, uh, concept is typically taught as a common argument as to why people consider advertising harmful things like gambling and smoking as ethical and not harmful overall. Not saying that the ads had no effect, but just a concept I thought you guys should be aware of. That's fucking fascinating. Yeah, Thank you for sharing that. And it makes so much sense. Also, why, are we, why do they do milk ads then? Like the National Milk Council? You got milk or like it must be a subsidy. It's got to be a subsidy. Got it's got to be, be. A, a subsidy. And they're like, well, we'll just spend it on advertising. I guess. You know, there was very recently, like three years ago, uh, almost going to be a big council for beer because beer sales are falling. Uh, and so all Probably because the there's a craft brewery on every other house in America. Well, and Gen then, Z isn't drinking. Yeah, and they are drinking seltzers. They are drinking different things, right? So, so beer specifically is in decline, and so all the major breweries were in discussion to do a Super Bowl ad where they would just say like, "Hey, beer's great," and then I think Coors ran. They decided to do an ad where they were like attacking other beer brands or whatever, and so it all fell apart. But there was almost like a council for beer. That's what we need. That was when I was on the hill. 
the, the beer brewers association or the beer lobbies. I can't remember what it was, but that was like, that's the one you wanted to get a ticket to when you were 24. <laughs> Hell yeah. Cause like that was going to be a lot of free beer and a lot of free, st- a lot of other staffers wanting to drink beer with you. Yeah. That's not fun. Crisis writes, I'm sure y'all don't have time for vapid computer games, but in case you are, there is a policy simulation program called Nation States where you (laughs) are presented various dilemmas and are presented with a myriad of policy prescriptions, each of which will affect your hypothetical nation in various ways. I'd be curious to see how each of you would mold your respective hypothetical nation. Have you played this game? No, but I've, I've read a book by the person that came up with this. It's called Jennifer Government. The protagonist is named... Jennifer government and the whole, uh, I'd like it, that book is such, are you a, sure just, this, this isn't just Bryony's rebrand. I know. Are you making <laughs> the, fun of me? <laughs> the, 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 the book is absolute commie palp. I like, I could barely finish it. It was the most commie palp I've read in years. Same guy developed this game. Maybe the game is good, but I can't risk that with my blood pressure. So I'm not going to play it. <laughs> well, now you have to, now yeah. you have to, Blast off writes, I'm disappointed by Jen's comments about SpaceX being supported by the United States government. It's the same mistake the New York Times made a couple weeks ago when, when it reported that SpaceX is foregoing subsidies and yet, quote unquote, ironically, is launching mostly government satellites. There is a difference between a subsidy to build and a fee for a service. If the government paid for Sony to build Blu-ray players and then bought them, that's a subsidy. But if the government rented Blu-rays from Netflix, that's a fee for a service. That SpaceX is the most reliable vehicle into space. Does it make it government supported? It makes the government the largest customer for its launches. Another person so disappointed in me. Um, were you? <laughs> Jesus. I should, these people that write in and say how disappointed they are. It's just, ugh, it's annoying. And also with this whole SpaceX thing, I wasn't, that wasn't the conversation. I was talking about how uncomfortable I was with a billionaire, specifically Elon Musk, having so much power in so many different parts of our society. I don't know and did not claim to know what the relationship is between SpaceX and the government, but the fact that this one billionaire has a hand in our space program, in the transition to electric cars, in owning fucking Twitter, like... That was the conversation we were having. So you've made your point, but it's not a point related to what I was actually talking about. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, my one thing with that is that what Elon Musk did and understanding that Elon Musk for many people is a paragraph and not two words because they have a lot of opinions about the guy. But he did do two, he built two companies that were thought to be impossible to build. Like the, the concept of building a private space delivery company was thought to be impossible. And a, an American car company, let alone an electric American car company, was thought to be something that never could happen. And so it's like he has found himself in this circle of which has tremendous influence, as you pointed out, like by way of, betting right and building two crazy companies. Yeah, but it's also like, I remember reading, and God, this was a long time ago, but I read a bill that had to do with insuring the um, the launch pads. Mm-hmm. And the way that it was structured, the taxpayers, we pay for a lot of the, the um, um, expenses if something goes wrong, if a rocket blows up. And like, so we directly subsidized everything that SpaceX does. So the idea that they're From like, the point that we were launching on government. Yeah, they've done thing. all kinds of stuff but with they, government they, that they couldn't they have built, done otherwise. Well, so they, they built the company before they started launching from like Edwards and Canaveral. But if they didn't have taxpayer subsidized insurance that was extremely generous, they might not have taken that risk. And so, but again, the point that I was making is that. Elon Musk himself is deciding who gets internet and who doesn't in Ukraine. Elon Musk is in the space program. Elon Musk controls a major communications network. This one man that no one elected, that was the conversation that we were having. I wasn't trying to get into the weeds of like, who's subsidizing who? But like, that was the point of everything I was saying in the last episode that, and go away from Elon Musk, Bill Gates, huge role in the vaccine rollout for COVID. Like these people are not elected to make these societally large decisions. And yet because of the wealth that we allow them to accumulate, they have that level of power. 
that's what the discussion was about. Now, if we want me to do some research into SpaceX and da, 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 I will do that. But that was not the topic of conversation. Okay. On basic training, military member here. From what I hear, the Marines have the hardest basic training, followed by the Coast Guard, then the Army. I'm in the Coast Guard, and from what I've seen, it's physically hard, but not nearly as much as the Marines or Army. Coast Guard basic training is mentally hard. The amount of knowledge required and the stress that comes with being threatened with reversion are what make it hard. I lost 30 pounds in basic training despite eating over 4,000 calories a day, and I feel like it was due to the stress. The idea of a mistake turning into a nine-week training into a 12- or 14-week training was constantly on my mind. Uh, the uh, training rights, the Air Force gets ridiculed by just about everyone. I think the Coast Guard is the only service branch that catches more flack, and they absolutely deserve every bit of it. Uh, I am the stepson of a Marine, the superior branch, only half joking. I was set to go to West Point, but was medically disqualified. You can sail the seven seas. You can put your mind at ease. Can I just like real quick, because I'm the stepsister of a chief petty officer from the Coast Guard, so I'm a little biased here, but... Um, they're heroes and what they do is very difficult. Um, you're not going to talk shit on the coast guard if you're drowning. So okay. no, I'm serious. Like I, I really don't, I know that we were kidding and all this, but the different branches of the military calling each other pussies, like that's one thing. That's but what we're doing. Any of us outside the military calling any of them pussies makes no sense whatsoever. Oh. Like I, I don't, none of them are pussies. I'm I will glad. say right here, I can take every single member of the armed services in a fight. Line up. I will fight every one of you. I believe I'm that strong. I just uh, don't want to be a part of a conversation of like, which one is the most pussy-ish? Like, none of them. Okay. Stop. The point, Army, two at one. Two the, at once. Come on. The, the, point, the point of this was I did, every time that I talk to military people, they love talking shit about each other, and I find it really funny when they talk shit about each other. So that was the point of this, is I wanted, I wanted to open up that uh, 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 water main and have that content flow into the podcast. You're I'm needling glad- the military. Against each other. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you made that point. And let me also say that somebody else emailed and was asking while we were talking about cars, whether or not any of us have fixed our own cars. Built mine no. from scratch. Oh. Got okay. it in parts, <laughs> built it myself. So I will say to both the military and mechanically inclined, we are soft-handed dilettantes huh. that would wither in the highway of life if we were not allowed to bloviate for a I living. could totally That's be in the military it. if they promised I never had to go above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> could totally do it. I went drinking with the Swiss military one time. That was fun. Those were good guys. I was in a um, burn or some fucking place in the mountains, and uh, uh, the, the Swiss tank operators came in in uniform, and I started shouting, show me your knives. Mm-hmm. And they came over and like, what, why would we? And I'm like, your Swiss Army knives. It's a thing. And then, like, I ended up getting really drunk, and one of them wanted to, like, get me to marry his sister so I could drive a tank, and I probably should have done that. I think that would have been a good... <laughs> you know, what, what a sliding door yeah, moment. If I'd become a tank driver in Switzerland, that could have been... You could have been, have been a... getting wound up on the World of Tanks forums. Yeah, that'd be me. Secrets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, All right, here we go. Uh, You can sail the seven seas. You can put your mind at ease. Brings us on home. Jen tried to make the argument that the Air Force is not full of pussies (laughs) by talking about the Blue Angels documentary. What the squadron does go through is very intense. Uh, And they do pull off stunning aerial maneuvers. And they are part of the Navy, (laughs) not the Air Force. (laughs) In fact, you have a better shot at being a pilot by being in the Navy or the Marines than the Air Force, statistically. Look at me not knowing shit. I'll fight every member of the Blue Angels. All lineup. right. I'll all take right. you to fight. We're not wrong as a production of Dog and Pony Show Audio. Our editor is Will Saddleberg. Uh, on PX3 this week, uh, debate prep. I do my deep dive on what the debate is and is not going to be, and specifically what Joe Biden and Donald Trump need to make you believe about them. Uh, and then on Friday... At least me and Heaton, uh, uh, maybe me and Heaton and Jen will be recording our immediate reaction to the debate and uh, putting that out. So that'll be PX3 this week. Jen. Uh, So it's not, it's recorded. We're in the process of editing it. So very soon, uh, the next congressional dish will be out. It was a fascinating examination of our home insurance issue because a lot of people can't get it or it's getting prohibitively expensive and there is a possibility and this is why i decided to do an episode about it that the problems with homeowners insurance have the capability of possibly setting off another 2008 style financial crash interesting yeah 
So if you want to hear the testimony about that, that'll be on the next congressional dish. Sweet. Heaton. I talk with a British economist about the war on prices. We get into what prices are and how you cannot actually curtail the value of something by just trying to eliminate bad information. So it's kind of a meat and potatoes economics episode on the political orphanage this week. Look at that. Yum. And that'll wrap it up for us. For Andrew Heaton and Jen Briney, my name is Justin Robert Young. Where? Not. Wrong. I'll fight you. (laughs) Each and every one of you.